One hour and 17 minutes.
telescopes so they'll work at their best. You're going to be out there with iconic astronomy. Hey everyone, Scott Roberts here from Explore Scientific. We've been talking about the Arizona Dark Sky Star Party all year long, but I really want to uh, emphasize what this is all about. This is a special place, a dark sky place, where you can get out with your telescopes so they'll work at their best. You're going to be out there with iconic astronomers. You'll be out observing with David Levy, you know, comet discoverer David Levy. Uh, we're going to have door prizes. We'll have art and music. The, the community of Oracle is getting together to support this. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, then we're also going to have a series of lectures at Biosphere 2, which is just down the road. Uh, so you're just going to love this um, and be out in those transparent, super dark skies that you can only find in Arizona. We hope to see you there September 21st to the 25th. Come to explorescientific.com forward slash events and sign up. If you want to see amazing Milky Way views, you want to observe the stars, you want to hang out with If you want to see amazing Milky Way views, you want to observe the stars, you want to hang out with astronomers, but you love art and you love music, you're going to want to come to the Arizona Dark Sky Star Party, September 21st to the 25th at Oracle State Park in Oracle, Arizona. It'll be an amazing event, and I know you're going to love it.
And, and I was like, oh. Vega, yeah. Altair, Arcturus. Live, Arcturus. Yeah, and it was like, uh, how about that? You know, he We got a countdown. Three, two, one. Dag we start blasted. talking. And Paul went, oh, dad gummit. Something's wrong. He started flicking buttons and clicking <laughs> switches and, and chasing mice. And it, all of a sudden, we were live and we knew it. Run. It'd be interesting. He's pretty quick. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty quick. So, so anyway, I have Tyler on as a special guest, which he's very special and he's a guest. Um, and, you something. know, I was wondering, and he and I literally have never talked about this before. So no, I don't, we actually haven't. I don't know how this came about. I started, you know, have, I've been talking, I've talked to one person how about they, they got started. I'm going to carry this theme a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You know, Tyler started doing astrophotography and didn't know a Dude. constellation name, no. a star name. You no. could look up in the, side, it's the sky. He could tell you it was the moon. And that was about <laughs> it by I looking. I Orion was. By uh, Orion, but yeah. boy, there wasn't much. But <laughs> last night he was saying, he was, we were talking and he was testing something and he was like, oh, there's Altair, and, and I was like, oh. There's Vega, yeah. Altair, Arcturus. Live yeah. Arcturus. Yeah, and it was like, uh, how about that? You know, he's getting some constellations. And that got me thinking last night, how did Tyler get started in astrophotography and without any astronomy background? We're going to talk about that. So, Osmosis 007. Ooh, that's a good name. Yes, it is. Well, yeah. I'm still new to the hobby. Got my first telescope since the 90s for Christmas this year. I honestly like to focus on eyepieces. I have the First Light Mac uh, 127. Yeah. Yep. Okay. You're talking about some of the Oh, talking about some of the live stuff. Yeah. So we've been having a live stream running. We're getting ready to broadcast 24 7 on a. Uh, multi-platform channel. We have a special device that cost about special device. It's cost about ten dollars. Very, <laughs> very affordable and inexpensive. <laughs> Maybe a little bit more than little bit that. A little bit more. Little bit more. Uh, so, you know, as um, so, are those coming from the previous show? No, those were. But these yeah. Are not. Sorry, we're reading the comments. But anyway, back to the topic that we're mainly looking at is you were wanting to know. Yeah, back to the topic <clears throat> at hand. How did you get started, Tyler? Well, the funny thing is I didn't start out in astrophotography first. Okay. I, I basically did because I just skipped visual altogether. Hey, Tyler. Yeah. Look at the camera. That thing? Yeah. But I like looking at you. I, that's anyway. painful to think about. <laughs> anyway, I started, my kid had a birthday. Um. Uh, how old was he? I think he was seven. One and of your kids. One of my kids. My you have two kids. Boy. There my we go. Boy. And he was wanting to get a telescope. He's always interested in the science stuff. Um, we ended up getting a, can I say the other one? Sure. It was a Celestron uh, alt mount. It was a combo kit. It was great for beginners. <laughs> That's about it. Pain to use. It was a real utter pain to use. But, but the point is, <laughs> It got you started. It got me started. Um, used that for a couple of months. He never picked it up, never touched it, just when I got it out of the box. It was the only time he messed with it. I was like, well, I'll, I'll tinker with it. I want to mess with it. I'm, I've always been interested in space, never had the funds or the resources to do it. So I'm better than I was when I was a child. Um, so we got that, started using it, and first thing we looked at was planets. We saw Jupiter. Mm -hmm. um, this scope did not come with a red dot finder. <laughs> what did it come with? Is a pipe straw finder scope? Ooh. Yeah, it was a six by 30 straight through. Ooh. <laughs> very hard to... Upside down and backwards. Yeah, very so, hard to align. So if you want to move up, you have to move down yeah. in the eyepiece. Yeah, if you want to move left, you have to move right. It, it was a challenging one, especially when they... What they, was it, an 80 millimeter telescope? That was a 70. 70? Yeah. Okay. Um, 500 millimeter refractor, something like that. No, uh, it was a seven. It was a six hundred. 
Yeah. So, so may, may have long, been a, it may have been long yeah, too. Yeah. The okay. thing was long. Yeah. Um, so we looked at the planets. They were great. He was again. He wasn't interested. But I'm like, holy crap! I can actually see a planet. This is pretty cool. I can see a planet because everybody looks up. It's like, oh, it looks like a star, but planets look like stars, but they're not stars. When you put them in a telescope, they're round. They're round. They're not just they're bright not just, pinpoints. Exactly. I mean, that's why Antares is called... In, not well, Mars. Not Mars. That is the utter word or the definition of Antares is not Mars. Because he told me that. I, know, I always found it was humorous. Because uh, it looks like Mars. It looks like Mars because it's a bright red star. Right. And, and people just, always got it confused when Mars... would. Because the funny thing is, Mars would actually go with it or... It follow times. the ecliptic plane and right. come alongside with it, and everybody got it confused. One, one was a wanderer, yep. a planet, and the other one was a star that, that didn't wander, yep. and it was not Mars. It was, so, and Terry. Not Aries. Yeah, so it was funny. So then we moved to, then I started looking at uh, constellations. Granted, didn't know a diddly thing about it, and this was before I even knew Explore so, Scientific so, was here. So this is how many years ago? Uh, we'll say five plus years. Okay. All right. So five plus years. I didn't know Explore Scientific existed because I just literally went on Amazon, bought this thing and been done. Um, okay. What is the title? Okay. Uh, that's the last one. <clears throat> yeah. That was so, what was previous. Okay. Was it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so I moved, he gave up an interest. He didn't want to do it anymore. So I was, I was continuing to tinker with it, but it did come with a smartphone adapter. Mm-hmm. And so I put my phone on it, and, the, and I went out to the front yard, and I pointed it due east. And during that time, it was it was beginning of winter, so I knew Orion was coming up. Because I've always had a fascination with an Orion. I can pick him out faster than anything because I knew where he was. It's very obvious. Once you it, learn that constellation, there's nothing else up there like it. Exactly. Um, so I literally took my phone, slapped it on the suction cups with a 25-millimeter eyepiece, Granted, this is with an Altaz mount. <laughs> Very terrible. Um, but it worked. Um, I got a fuzzy outside core image of Orion. And you were excited. I was giddy as a kid. We should have gotten that picture because we know we're going to talk about I think about my this. mom still has that picture. You need to get that picture and I think show. my mom still has that picture. Because um, <clears throat> you were just happy to get. That was the first person I sent it to. Something. Yeah, I got something. I got a little nebula and it was with the phone. So Mike Wiesner is right. You can get a whole lot of stuff with the phone. Oh, yeah. If you work it right, you know what you're doing. So and that literally drove me into a sinkhole, and right. I'm still sinking. So then what you do? What was the journey like after that? The journey, I still wanted to do visual because uh, I went on cloudy nights like everybody does and just try to soak up information as much as you can. And trust me, there is Well, how did you find cloudy nights? So you didn't, you had no background. You didn't know what cloudy nights was. <clears throat> Google. So what did you Google? Telescope information. And here was this forum. Forum. Uh, there's there was a lot of forums, um, but Cloudy Nights was the the first one that popped up, which I'm still surprised that Explore Scientific didn't pop up at that time. Um, so I went to Cloudy Nights forum, created an account, and just read information, just read, 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 read. Um, created some posts saying name is blah blah blah. I'm new to the thing. Wore some good books. You, you let your in, you let your ignorance hang out. Pretty much. Yeah. It's okay. I'm very ignorant sometimes. Well, we all are on stage. We don't know anything about. Uh, I asked what's some good books to read uh, because I think that's the main staple is if you're wanting to get into this hobby, get some, I would recommend at least two or three good books. Left Turn at Orion. Um, that's one. I'm trying to think of another one. Oh, my God. Ba well, I would recommend that one beginning. Yeah. would be Left Turn at Orion. That will give you the basic concept of how a telescope works. Um, constellations, and they have um, they have the, con the the constellation movement. I can't think of the word. They have maps. They have the constellation maps. Yeah, Osmosis 007 yeah. said same thing. Yeah, yeah. Get, get a yeah. planisphere. Uh, planet. See, I didn't even know about planispheres. Okay. Um, until eventually, I found Explore Scientific. My, got hooked up with my catch. My catch helped me along that way. Picked up a mentor who I still talk to about visually. He says, you need to learn the sky first. Mm -hmm. You need to learn the sky first because if you're using a manual mount and you don't know what you're looking at, you're going to be lost. You won't know where you're at. You're just who was that? Uh, his name is Joe uh, Agassani. Oh, that's going to say Piscopo. 
No. Is uh, he's? Do you know who Joe Piscopo is? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Tell me later. Did he die? I think so. Yeah. Starting out live. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> Matt, Joe told me to learn the sky, and he also sent me a upgraded telescope because I've at this point I've upgraded my mount to a tracking mount. It was a Celestron AVX. Started out with one of those, and a Orion. 120 ST, or it was a 102 ST. It was a big, giant aluminum tube, real heavy. It's like an F4, F5 scope. Great. Big Newtonian telescope. No, it was a refractor. Refract it was a doublet. Okay. It was really great. Great for plant, great for the moons, deep sky objects, and that's why he recommended it to me. And he gave me one. Um, and then I asked him what type of eyepieces should I start out with. He said, "Well, since you're young and your eyes are still good, but you're a beginner." and you're saving money, start out with the 52 degree series. Doesn't matter if it's a kit from Amazon or again, Explore Scientific or anybody's. If you start out with a 52 degree series, you won't be disappointed because it gives you the best views and it's the best bang for your buck. Right, not expensive. And it's not gonna break the bank. It's not gonna have you killed by your wife. Right. Um, Although it did come later. It did come later. Yes. It still, still sometimes still happens. <laughs> uh, so I started using the Orion and, and the AVX and started learning the sky visually. I didn't do it for very long. <clears throat> I maybe gave it um, six months. And then I said, no, I don't want to do this because the sky is huge. If you don't think how big the sky actually is and how many objects there, there are. There's a quote for you. The sky is huge. <laughs> That's big. It's very it's big. big. <laughs> there's a total of 88 constellations. Now, I don't know if that's a counting of the Southern Hemisphere as well. It does. So, you, well, how many do you see in the Northern Hemisphere then? 60-something. So, 60 constellations that you're looking throughout the whole night. You know how many objects that is? 10 or 12. Or more. Maybe <laughs> more. There's a ton of the, stuff. There's, the hard part is learning where it is. Is, is, is. is knowing what to look at. Not even let, <clears throat> Even with a go-to mount. You can put that thing is, and it gives you a Messier whatever. Well, what the heck's a Messier object? Well, it, it should tell you what it is. Well, not in, uh, not uh, Miss, Explore Stars Explore does. Explore Stars does, mm -hmm. but not the mount that I had at the current time. Right. It did not give you much of a database. It gave you an RA and a deck coordinate. That's all it gave you. It didn't give you any what it is or anything. Um, so is that a current comment from Tariq? Yeah, that one is. I bought many books. I didn't read them yet. I don't know when I will read them. Now I'm scared of that if I read them, that I will find out that I've learned that already without hey, books. Tariq, I'll tell you right now, read them. <clears throat> I go back and read books I've read before, and I always learn something new. You always uh, do. You know, it's like it's like I'll read the Exos, the, the, the PMC-8 system manual. Yeah. You know, just read it again just to think about what I'm working on and what I'm doing. Mm-hmm to read just read it don't be afraid of if you learn something you've already learned that's just reinforcement it is right you're just soaking it in you're soaking it in right okay so <clears throat> where were we at you had uh, stubbed your toe oh, yeah. and were that's tired right. of that's right the sky was too big of a place for your meager, meager soul and so you decided <laughs> to uh uh just start you were going to say start taking <clears throat> pictures Start taking pictures. Right. So I had a Nikon D3200, which mm -hmm. is a basic kit camera or DSLR. Right. So then learning visual, it was tough for me because you're learning focal lengths, you're learning field of views, you're learning apertures, you're learning not really f-stops, but you're learning um, field of views uh, to a degree. And you're suffering <clears throat> from Bortle 7, six, six, six guys. Five, six, yeah. Yeah. So I can see stuff. That a lot of people can't. A lot of people can't. I can see galaxies, um, M101, M51. Um, but you didn't know where to look. Didn't know where to look. Even I can have a controller to tell me. I didn't know what diddly squat a polar alignment was either at mm -hmm. that time. Doing yeah. visual. Didn't have yeah. a clue. Pointed it north, got the latitude, but I was probably off four or five degrees. Left or right? Probably to the left. Yeah, but but one way, I mean, one way or another, I was right. off, and it would never slew to where I was wanting to go. Which, which is why my method your of... Your broom method. Yeah, the broom method. The broom method always works, or it, the compass. The compass. The compass 
works. The compass works. We, did, we actually did it in Fort Worth. <laughs> yeah, I've told that story. Let's show you a version of that. Of the Fort Worth one? Yeah. <clears throat> so me and Ken had to go to Fort Worth, Texas a month ago. And some people were wanting, and we, it was basically we were out there just promoting our stuff. And we were at a camera shop. In a camera shop. And I figured, well, I'm going to throw an 80, 80 millimeter on an IXOS 100 right. with a DSLR on it. How do you pull it? It only had two counterweights on it. It only had two counterweights. It needs three, three. to balance. We only yeah. had two. Tough. We just did it. And guess what? It worked. It worked. So he was behind me. And I was pointing the I had the front leg pointing north and he was telling me to go left or right and I had to make Cl small, clockwise counterclockwise. Yeah, cl clockwise counterclockwise. And once I got it in frame, once I, I, once I said, "Okay, we're done." I went off to do something else. Yeah, you went off to do something. I so salute to yeah, the sun. Question. Yep. Is it your version or Tyler's version you're wondering about? Well, it's hard because I know what my version is and his his is wrong. <laughs> go ahead, finish up. <laughs> I thought it was a different side of the story. Uh, finish up your version. Uh, his, his is the correct version. Paul, you make your good point, but <clears throat> mine's right. So I slew to the sun with the camera on. And I could see the sun, and I just let it sit there because he always says, let it sit, see if it drifts. Mm -hmm. And it didn't drift. It didn't move at all. Now, I noticed that it wasn't dead center of the frame, but I didn't care. It was an 80-millimeter scope. But it was, it was the full disk of the sun. It was the full disk of the sun. Well within yeah. the image of the field of the camera. Correct. So it wasn't like it was like... It wasn't half the off the half sun. Half off. It was, it was full yeah. disk, see it, but it was just in the corner of the view. Okay, of the so you let's let it drift to let just, the motors catch <clears> up. Let, the, let it sit there that. for two or three minutes to let it catch up. And then I just... Actually, I, I barely even move it. I don't even touch it. I, and I came out and said, how close was it? Right there. And he said, I saw it. I said, did you have to adjust it left, right, up, down? No. And, and we let it set for six and a half hours. Yeah. It, well yeah. over five hours. Yeah. Right? yeah. It, it never moved. Towards the end, it started drifting off in declination <clears throat> just a little bit. Oh, because of the meridian flip. We had to do a, a manual. Yeah. And to do a meridian flip, with, and this was on an IEX OS 100. Yeah. And, it, and with the PM state system, Either the Exos 2 GT with PMC8 or the IE XOS 100, <laughs> a meridian flip is real simple to do. It is. You, a meridian flip is what happens when the telescope gets across the sky, it goes past the meridian. And so to get it back in balance and everything, you've got to flip the meridian. So it's real simple. You just, if you did a go to to like the sun, mm -hmm. after it gets past the meridian, it's real simple. You just go and do another go to to the sun. It, it right knows it's past the meridian, so yep. it flips everything around and does the flip for you. And we were almost right back on the sun, went bink, bink, bink. And that was it for another three hours. I mean, it was really impressive how accurate of a polar line we got. With a magnet. With, with a with magnet. Magnetic and, 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 one, and me holding the compass up like this with one eye, looking at the compass angle, you know, and telling Tyler to move it. Twist it right back a little bit. That's it. Oh, oh yep, yeah, right there. Literally took a minute. Yeah. And we, we got lucky. <laughs> polar, perfect polar alignment. Skill. Yeah, luck. There's still luck involved in that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's, that's so, years of But you didn't it. know how to do that. I didn't know how to polar alignment. Yeah. No, I didn't even know what a polar alignment was. I didn't delve deep enough into cloudy nights. So why didn't you just walk away right there? I didn't want to. I don't have that personality to get up and walk away. So, I don't. You felt like you could brute force it. Yes. No, no offense to <laughs> yeah. muscles. You felt, uh, I mean, you really felt like you, you by golly, I can't. I wasn't going to stop until this. I got it. I'm not the most smartest person in the world, and I'm not, but I'm not the most dumbest person in the world. And things for, for me to understand things, I have to read a lot. <laughs> and so giggle, you just started. Giggle and giggle. <laughs> yeah. And Tyler and reading go together like peanut butter and sand. Yes. I don't read. I'm not a reader. I, I learn by trial by error. Yeah. I read some of the information if I need to read it, and then I was like, all right, I, I read it. I'm going to go do it. And then I'm just going to trial by error and be done. And that's how he coaches baseball too, but different story. That's why we won three championships. No, that was brute force of the boys. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> they hit the ball farther than that's the other team far. did. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. <clears throat> so once I learned how to polar align, then the actual go-to accuracy improved dramatically right 100 percent dramatically so i'm slewing to objects looking Weird. at it 
and the polar, polar alignment, alignment just made things fixes work better. everything better. Wow. Oh, no, it still worked, yeah. just better. <laughs> yeah, just better. Just better. Um, so the porting accuracy was a lot better. Um, but I was, with the 120, I can't remember the field of view that I was able to get with it without, I think the focal length was around 600. So it gave me a nice field of view. I can get most objects, uh, clusters, um, <laughs> most Messier objects. I mean, in the North, North American Nebula is not going to fit because it's you so big. You can't see it. Yeah, you can't see you it. You can't you know? see it. That's yeah. the problem. You can see the star yeah. formations, but right. you, can't you can't see, see the nebula. It's not, it's not like Orion the M42 where you can see it. Yeah. There's lots of nebulas it. that you, you might be able to see under – you, you can you see dark. under really dark skies. Yeah. You can, that's how people found them was in yeah. really dark skies. Yeah. So but where yeah. I'm at, you can't see them. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, because you were out the other a, a while ago, um, we were using the bino viewers, mm -hmm. I believe, and trying to find M101. Yes, to see what it looked like. To see what it looked like, we could find. We it was, was it was maybe there, but it was, it was, maybe so, there. It was so so crappy weather and sky right. and seeing. Right. And that's the other thing is I didn't know what seeing how seeing played or involved in anything. Because one night you'd go out and get great <clears> pictures. And you got the next night, and you couldn't get diddly. diddly. And you didn't understand that the sky was different that night. The air was I had no more idea moving. why the stars twinkled. I just thought it was normal. Didn't think anything yeah. of it. And didn't, um, and you didn't have a correlation. That like, last night, I, I, I didn't notice the stars weren't twinkly. But now you know last night was a really steady <clears throat> night, and yeah. maybe they weren't twinkling as much. Yeah. But tonight, they're twinkling, and your pictures are cruddy Yeah. because... You didn't use the telescope or the camera or Damn you did something food. wrong. Yeah. No idea that the sky was fighting you tooth and nail. Yep. Yeah. So, <clears throat> again, I go back to the forums, try to figure out, because I've taken pictures on the back of a DSLR. Still don't know what processing is. Still don't know what stacking is. Hey, there's Cesar. Cesar Brolo. Hello, Cesar. Hey, Cesar. Uh, don't know any of that stuff. I'm just taking pictures mm -hmm. just to see what I can get. I literally slew to an object. Oh, okay, take a picture. Take a thirty-second exposure. Um, so you still hadn't started stacking or any what no what you consider to be some modern astrophotography. I didn't, I didn't even know what stacking was. Yeah, didn't have a clue. So how many years ago are we now? After you started, after you got your <clears throat> telescope for the kid and he didn't use it, and so, you got your first picture, how much? What what time frame are we talking now? Two or three months after. So we're still talking five, we're still seven within years a year. ago? Yeah, we're still within seven a year. Seven years ago? Yeah. Okay. We're still within a year. Okay. Um, so then once I figured out, then it's like, oh, doing some more digging on the forums, you learn that, oh, you can actually stack pictures. Did not know that. You can stack pictures. So now I have a whole bunch of pictures that I try to stack, and I'm like, okay, there's how do I stack it? Well, there's got to be software or something out there. So... It's again, you have to Google or go to forums to figure it out. <clears throat> Nowadays, you can literally post it on social media and someone will just give you the answer. Yeah. It kind of chaps me a little bit. <laughs> it's easy. The reality is, Tyler, astrophotography <clears throat> is easier and easier and easier than it was for me. Yeah. I tried to do it with film, and you had yeah, to take yeah, it to, yeah. and you had to get it processed. Luckily, I had a good process black and white film, and still struggled. <laughs> if you're trying trying to shoot in color, you know Scott tells the story of trying to guide for like an hour, yeah, looking in an eyepiece with a left round, with a with a, with a reticle eyepiece that has like a crosshair, like a a pound sign or a hashtag, yeah, and you real high power, and you keep the star in the center. And when you see it drifting, you hit the left button or the up button to get it centered back up. You get centered back up. Trying to get a 30-minute or an hour exposure. The, the problem is you if know. you do that during an exposure, you could be messing up the whole image. But you had to. That was the only way to guide. I, I know. That's the only way you could guide. Yeah. But it was it was the precursor of people finally thought, well, I could figure out how to put a, 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 a CCD on, camera on yeah. the CMOS camera, and maybe I could keep it on the same pixel. That's It was the same exact thing. That's what a guide well, camera does. Theoretically, pixel. It's just got a. It's on one little spot, and when yeah. it starts moving off, it goes. Oh, left button, left button, left button, up, up, up button, up, up button, down, up, right, and just up, keeps right, doing down, it until it down. keeps it on that spot. Yeah. it's the same thing. It's the same concept. It's just digital, not analog. With Scott looking through an eyepiece for that. That would have been fun to see. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Cesar Brolo says my interest uh, is in trying some pictures with cell phone and some planets. And plant camp sensor, 
sensible DSO, deep subjects, he's also going to set up his uh, Axos 100 with a Nat Geo 114. F4.36. 38. Oh, 38, yeah. Numbers. numbers. Yeah. <laughs> Almost like letters and words. They are. Yeah, so, so that's that's going to be interesting to it'll see. It'll be interesting to see the cell phone. I think it'll be interesting to see what he gets with a Nat Geo 114 F4.38 telescope. Yeah. You know, what, 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 he, what he gets. To try to get with a cell phone and some yeah. planetary cameras. That, because that National Geographic 114 is not an expensive telescope. No, gosh, no. You know, uh, yeah. And also what he gets with his cell phone. So That and the planetary camera. And, and, those sensors are small. Oh, yeah. Little small sensors. So you get a small sensor, you're increasing the field. Well, you're not increasing. You're decreasing the, the field of view. You're decreasing the field of view yeah. tremendously so it can focus just on that one little speck. Yeah. Hey, Pekka. Hey, Pekka. How are you, sir? Glad it's to see you totally. with us. Oh, that's okay, Pekka. We're still yeah. rambling we're still, on. We're still rambling on. We got another... 34 minutes of ramble. I can so, think of something. Yeah, we can talk. So, okay, but you're still six months into this. I'm still six months in, seven years ago, and I'm just now figuring out their stacking capabilities. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, I picked Deep Sky Stacker because, again, Google, mm -hmm. um, astrophotography stacking software is just my only thing, which you Google, and the first thing that popped up at that time was Deep Sky Stacker. Um, so once I get that all downloaded and all that stuff, I throw all my images in. Mm -hmm. I said, kicks it out immediately. It says, no. It's like, no, can't do it. Reject. Darks, flats, biases. No clue what those were. Yeah. Didn't have a clue. Granted, deep sky So stack, you just took a bunch of pictures of? A bunch of raw images from the camera. Of what? Uh, do you remember? Like M42 or no. just a galaxy or I something? I think it was maybe just a mixture of galaxies, M42, but it wasn't like but you 60 try, or 70. But it was you like tried to three. stack a bunch of different objects together? <laughs> really? You didn't know? <laughs> no. So you took like M42 and a couple of galaxies and some Star clusters. And, and dumped all them stuff. all in together and Deep Sky Sacker went, nope, reject. <laughs> okay. So once I learned, they all, obviously all the light frames had to match. And then you had to figure and what the so light frames, if you don't know what light frames are, light frames are your actual exposures of the object you're trying to get. Yep. Right. Yep. Oh, we got Mike Wiesner with us. He's uh oh. He's twisting Cesar Brolo's arm to come from <laughs> South America. I'll be to the, it. Ooh. There's a dark sky star party in September. Cell phone talk. Yeah. Cell and phone so talk. if y'all are wanting to come, you know, uh, it's going to be a great time. It's in Oracle, Arizona, September 21 through 24. Mm -hmm. You saw a uh, uh, Scott talking about it at the top of the show. We'll probably run that again here at the close of the show as well. Yeah. So anyway, all right. So back to so light frames. So like Kent said, light frames are just a tar uh, uh, whatever you're imaging, just constant exposure. So you're shooting what exposures? <clears throat> uh, Thirty seconds a minute. Thirty seconds, a hundred other time. Okay. So once I got my light frames, and then I did the process all over again with Deep Sky Stacker, dumped all the raw frames in, kicked it out again immediately. Because? It didn't have any light or flats, darks, or biases. It doesn't have to, does it? Yes, it does. It has to? It doesn't have to, but it's recommended. Highly, okay. highly, 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 highly so, recommended. So it, so it could have stacked them up. You know, at this point, you didn't have to know how to make it, right? Yeah. So I wanted to... I, once I try to do things, I try to do it right the first time. That way I can build a repeatable pattern and keep going and going and right. going. Um, oh, question. You guys, you know, guys, older SCTs have the kind of amazing good optics that I've blown away. The original EPs were better than any of my high-end EPs, and they're from mid-70s, but made in Japan. Well, you said the key word, or, well, semi-sentence, made in Japan. Um, Japan's optics... I, you know, mm -hmm. today's coatings and better the coatings glass. Coatings are, be are better. The coatings are better glass. Yeah. And, you know, there's, um, you know, I've got some eyepieces from the 80s, and they really don't compare to Not like modern eyepieces. No. I mean, they just. Well, it, there's it, what, it's two like, or three lenses in one, and now we're up to, we have seven to eight. Or nine or ten. Or nine or ten in an eyepiece. And. Feel or field? When you say hot, you mean like stolen? <laughs> popular because they got that re because that that super retro look to them. No, you know, 
Yeah. Cold War look. <clears throat> They're all handmade and polished. Mm-hmm. Machine polished and final figure by hand. Yeah. So, you know. Mm. Just like our, we know, we know for a fact that there are some out there in the wild. Yeah. You know, we guarantee our refractors to be to be a minimum of quarter wave. Uh, which, we don't let them go until. They're, yeah, we we don't we don't sell them if, don't sell them if, if they don't come in at, at quarter wave or better. We don't sell them mm-hmm. uh, at all. I mean, we just don't we sell them. Sell we them. send them back. <clears throat> but um, I've looked at interferograms, and there are some one tenth wave and one twelfth wave telescopes out there, uh, which are high end research grade research grade telescopes that somebody got for the retail price of an FC one hundred. Uh, 127, uh, and you know, um, we we don't let people telescope shop and, and get no. the interferogram and say, oh, I don't like this and send it back. Oh, I don't like this one, because they're fishing for Better. the diamond yeah. in the much the gravel. And you you know, it, it there may be 250 telescopes in that batch, and there's not, two not, with one tenth wave. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> and, and for what everybody needs, one quarter wave wave is perfectly fine. But, yeah, but it sure feels. But it, it would be sort of just amazing to say I've got a one tenth wave telescope. You don't, you don't ever use the resolution it can give you because you just don't have it. Except it wasn't the same exact lens. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Caesar Brolo agrees that the FCD 100 127 is amazing. I, ha- I have one. I have an FCD 100 127. It's in the showroom. It's mm-hmm. the showroom model. I take it out and use it. It is a beautiful telescope. It's carbon fiber version. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, <clears throat> you're still chugging along trying yep. to figure out how to run DSS. Yeah, just run DSS. I have to figure out how to take dark spices and flats. Now, okay, talk are about dark spices and flats? Mm-hmm. No, it's been a while since I've had to give this talk, so you may have to correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> Flats, if I remember correctly, are the same exposure of a light, just taken a heck of a lot quicker. No, actually, it's the same exposure, but you have a, uh, at the time, I used an iPad. Yeah, but I just, you can, I white screened it. A lot of people take a t-shirt. Yeah, and, a t-shirt, and, throw, it, throw it up at dawn or dusk. And point it straight up into the sky. Or they'll use a, a fluorescent light and point it up in the sky. Yeah. And take, but they're taking pictures of it, what you want. It, it, it. truck over the big red in town and God help and brought him back. He's like, what? That's pretty cool. Well, did he get hit by a car or something? Was he hurt in a crash? No, nope, nothing like that. Well, what happened? Well, I was down there pretty late. He said, well, one morning early before I woke up, the house caught on fire. I didn't know. Big, he broke in the house. He come, came in and drug me out. Saved my life. I thought it was really cool. I said, did he really wake in a fire? No. I said, okay, well, why in the hell would they have killed him? I don't even understand. Why in the hell would they kill a dead human animal?
so much important information as we share the education, the experience, answering questions from the audience, that kind of things. Thank you for watching our 24-hour a day live stream here at Explore Scientific, where we show you all the programs that we run live in front of a live audience. Programs like Global Star Party, On the Wing for Birders, First Light Chronicles for Beginners, and Focus on Astrophotography for Astrophotographers. We bring in astronomers and explorers from around the world to answer your questions live. But there's so much cool information there that we decide to package it all together and run it 24 hours a day. We're also on Amazon Live, uh, where we do deep dives into our products and our gear. There's so much important information as we share the education, the experience, the answering questions from the audience, that kind of thing. So tune in, and thanks for watching. Thank you for watching our 24-hour a day live stream here at Explore Scientific, where we show you all the programs that we run live in front of a live audience. Programs like Global Star Party, On the Wing for Birders, First Light Chronicles for Beginners, and Focus on Astrophotography for Astrophotographers. We bring in astronomers and explorers from around the world to answer your questions live. But there's so much cool information there that we decide to package it all together and run it 24 hours a day. We're also on Amazon Live, uh, where we do deep dives into our products and our gear, uh, all designed to help you have a greater exploration experience. There's so much important information as we share the education, the experience, the answering questions from the audience, that kind of thing. So tune in, and thanks for watching. Hey there, everybody. Dr. Daniel Barth here with episode 43 of the How Do You Know program. Scott Roberts is traveling and may be joining us from remote today. I am. I am There's Scott. Now. Hey there, Scott. How are you? Yeah. Doing well, thank you. And uh, I am in the uh, lovely high tech Explore Scientific studios up in Springdale today at okay. the Explore store. So that's, that's kind of fun. I got to come up and do a. Uh, Amazon live program with uh, my good pal Kent Martz and I'm hoping right. some of you all tune into that it's a it's a fun show about explore scientific products and science education and uh, helping set hearts afire for science and mathematics with well kids of all ages really so uh, as we get into uh, episode 43 uh, this is the uh, this is, uh, this is the crazy, like the uh, busy time of the year for me as a working professor of STEM education. Uh, we are entering the last two weeks of the semester at my university, at the University of Arkansas, and that means all the end of semester projects are coming in. And uh, last week somebody said, well, how much stuff are you talking about when you're talking about grading? Doc, and so uh, <laughs> I went and photographed my 14-inch stack of materials, and somebody says, well, how much is that really? So I threw it on the bathroom scale, 17.4 pounds of paper to read through and grade, and that was just last week. I've got another stack coming in this week, but then uh, thankfully the uh, semester will be wrapping up uh, the second week of May here. And I will have more time to focus on fun things like astronomy and uh, science education activities that are outside the classroom. So we're going to have some opening comments today. Uh, we try to do this every week. We don't always get to it. But um, part of my prep for this show, friends, is I spend a fair amount of time uh, I have a lot of news feeds that come in from NASA, from ESA, uh, from JAXA, uh, 
and uh, different space agencies, and I'm looking at what they're doing. One of the fun things I saw, and how long have I been a space science fan? Since for more than half a century, since the Apollo era. And I just learned, I was today years old when I learned that there is a website that will show you what the Hubble Space Telescope is looking at live. And uh, we have our show notes for today, which Scott is always kind enough to download, uh, make available as a download for you. And there's a uh, website called spacetelescopelive.org slash latest. And when you log on to this website, it shows you what the Hubble telescope is seeing right now, which is, to me, so exciting. Uh, Hubble has been up there for more than 30 years, and we're looking at what's coming down from one of the world's first space telescopes right now. So it's, it's a very dynamic and interesting thing, and you can see uh, what Hubble is looking at in a little bit about it which is a fun thing, and uh, there's also a Space Telescope Live Twitter account. So if you all are Twitter users, <clears throat> that's another fun science adventure for you. Yeah, every once in a while when you look up, Hubble will be slewing around to a new target, and so there will be no feed at that point. But um, it, it's fun. I've just become addicted to popping in and out. What's Hubble looking at right now? And of course, time on the Hubble telescope is extraordinarily precious. The process for getting in to get Hubble space telescope time, that's no small deal, friends. You have to submit a proposal, defend it, committees critique it, and other space scientists decide, are you worthy? Because there's only one Hubble, and there's lots of people who want to use it. The other thing that I was just stunned, and every once in a while I come across science news and I'm just amazed. Uh, some of you may be fans of the Star Trek universe in the various programs, <clears throat> and I forget which program it was, but they had the holographic doctor. He had no name, he was an emergency holographic program, and he would come online and said, What's your medical emergency? And the idea is if the regular doctor got a sick or injured, that the holographic doctor could go ahead and tell you what to do. <clears throat> well, guess what? We are living in the future, and NASA beamed a doctor up to the ISS as a three-dimensional hologram that people could see and view and interact with in real time. I am so stunned by this. And uh, the Microsoft Holovision camera system that they used for Xbox was part of this research. And they have a projector on the ISS, and they were actually able to beam a doctor as a hologram live into the ISS, which makes me think the next rover that goes up Heck yeah, we could have, we could, I mean, how much would you pay, Scott, to be holographically beamed to Mars and to be able to look out and swivel around and see what you could see from the rover? Probably a lot. Probably a Probably lot. Probably quite a bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you, I, don't, I don't think I could, maybe Scott could afford it, y'all. I don't think I could. <laughs> Maybe Explore could afford to buy me uh, two minutes on Mars. But, oh, my gosh, I realized that as, at my age, I am never flying to Mars. I dreamed of it as a kid. Oh, oh my yeah, gosh, I went to Mars. Oh, oh yeah. Up there. Right. Yeah, to be able to go up as, as a holograph on the moon, on the ISS. I, I'm going to get two minutes on the ISS just to look out the window as a hologram, and somebody could take a picture of me as a hologram up there looking out the window, I would pay some serious coin for that. 
And you might say, yes. that's a frivolous use of technology in the internet. No, it's not. Oh my gosh. Not at all. That's a not great at all. use of technology not at all in the internet. When we make it real for people, part of what the astronauts in the Apollo program did for folks on mm -hmm. Earth is they made space travel real to them. They were more than astronauts. They were more than scientists. They were fun, engaged fellas having fun doing science on the moon. And to some extent, we all went with them. Sure. That one of the last pictures of the moon, and I think it's Dave Scott, and he's jumping up and saluting, and uh, his uh, co-commander is taking the picture there, and just wow. Just yeah, yeah. wow. Live from the moon. I remember Apollo 11, they just had the, the headline down in the bottom. In the Live, from the Live from the moon. Live from the moon. We're like, what? You Which know? we haven't done that since 1972. Oh my gosh, it's right. 50 years since we've been to the moon with people, which is a so shame. Can you imagine what the video is going to be like, though? The video coming yeah. back from the moon will be crisp, yeah. clear, 4K, or oh, yes. 8K, or whatever. Oh know, my gosh, so. the people, I, I remember teaching high school and showing some of these Apollo videos to students, and they said, are you sure it's real? It's so blurry. I'm like, you guys know this is like 1960s TV technology. Yeah, it was it was it's quite low red. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so, Scott, one of the other things we've talked about recently is we mm -hmm. chatted about the solar tsunami. And we've yes. had some, the sun is in a very active phase. We've had a lot of yes, aurora. Sir. And people as south as uh, the northern United States have been able to see some aurora in recent weeks. Well, we talked about this idea. Would the solar tsunami destroy our modern technological civilization? And it's interesting. The car website, Hemmings, which is a car enthusiast uh, website, Scott, they did some research and they looked up and they did some research on could your car survive an EMP? And they actually went to a facility, and they took some relatively new cars from, I think they were surveying cars from about uh, 2000 to 2010, some as old as 1990. And they were trying to decide, would older cars do a better job surviving one of these solar catastrophes? And it was interesting. What they found is something I realized I kind of slapped my forehead. I should have known that. What they found was that most cars do just fine surviving a solar catastrophe because when we have this geomagnetic storm, what's happening is the magnetic field is waving and it induces current. And we've all heard about the Carrington event, 1859 and this huge solar storm auroras all the way down to Cuba and they were saying that, oh, telegraph wires, they were having enough electricity to run the telegraph without batteries. The sparking caused some telegraph stations to start on fire. And they said, oh, well, this thing could be terrible. And in 1989, I believe it was, they had a very large solar storm that blacked out a large section of Canada. And what happened again, this waving magnetic field induces a current in a wire. However, it's not just the strength and fluctuation of this magnetic field that does this, Scott. What we've really got here, friends, it's also the length of the wire. If you were ever the kind of kid who took things apart, I did. Yeah, and you ever, Scott, did you ever take apart an electric motor? I took apart everything. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so for the toy that I got for Christmas, it was a part. You know, exactly. I had to see the motor. I had to uh, see how it worked. My mother, God bless her, used to tell the story uh, that as a six year old, I took apart her very expensive Electrolux vacuum cleaner. And she oh. called my uncle, oh my God, Danny's taking apart my vacuum cleaner. 
and you have to come over here. By the time my uncle got over, I was afraid I was going to get in trouble. I reassembled it. And my mother said, don't touch it. And he said, well. And so he used his foot and turned it on, and it worked. <laughs> well, if you were a kid and you took apart an electric motor, what you may have found was that in the interior of the motor 